So uh, welcome everyone to the Perinatology Research Branch lecture series on developmental evolution of uh, female reproduction. Um, uh, Dr. Romero has uh, uh, suggested to put this uh, lecture series together because evolutionary medicine has uh, gained um, uh, prominence and, uh, and influence over the last you know, 20 to 30 years. And, um, and uh, we thought it would be nice to actually pull together various um, developments in, uh, related to female reproduction that uh, can be gleaned from um, evolutionary biology. Now, evolutionary biology is a complex field, and I uh, chose here to use a particular perspective, uh, and that is the perspective of developmental evolution, which uh, arose about you know, three or four decades ago from a fusion of developmental biology and evolution, evolutionary biology. Um, I will explain a little bit later what the specific uh, perspective is of developmental evolution, and you will see that it is a part of evolutionary biology that is really uh, prone to be connected to a mechanistic understanding of um, organismal function. Uh, for this year, we have prepared four or planned four uh, lectures, uh, one that I start today, a uh, July one uh, on the role of inflammation in uh, mammalian viviparity. Uh, then in August, uh, Professor Vincent Lynch uh, will talk to us about evolutionary influences on embryo invasion, how uh, the depth of invasion and its regulation has evolved. And in December, uh, we'll have a, a lecture by Professor Pavlicev from the University of Vienna on an evolutionary uh, pr perspective and actually new perspective on obstetric, uh, on the obstetric uh, dilemma. For the next uh, year, we have an, um, uh, another uh, set of, uh, of lectures planned, uh, but the dates have not been yet uh, uh, finalized, so I cannot give you the dates for those. So today, my lecture is uh, called uh, Many Faces of Viviparity. And with that, I would like to give you an overview of how viviparity is um, realized in different branches of the vertebrate uh, tree. In fact, I would be hard pressed to give you an overview of how viviparity is happening in all of animals because it is actually quite uh, widely uh, distributed. <clears throat> And the uh, purpose is to just see how many forms of viviparity there are, how they relate to each other, and how we can learn um, how the uh, complex uh, forms of viviparity that we are most familiar with in mammals and humans in particular uh, came about. So we are all um, aware that uh, viviparity or pregnancy is the hallmark of uh, human reproduction. And I think everyone who ever cared for um, a, a woman in pregnancy is aware that this process is very, very complex in, with many uh, uh, independent um, uh, events from fertilization, implantation, recognition of pregnancy, development of the placental bed, um, uh, maintenance of pregnancy, all the processes that are necessary to, to pregnancy can continue and fetal growth is possible, eventually leading to cervical ripening and preparation for population. Of course, uh, the most important question is uh, for anyone interested in the biomedical sciences of uh, pregnancy is how does this complex uh, process actually work so that we have a chance of intervening when it is uh, necessary. Now, the way how pregnancy was, of course, uh, studied was, you know, by studying how it can get wrong uh, uh, sometimes how hormonal changes are uh, correlated with gestational uh, uh, stages, uh, you know, the genetics and uh, inheritance of pregnancy influencing traits and so on. And uh, all of that is, of course, uh, the, uh, the, the bedrock of, uh, of an understanding, scientific understanding of uh, uh, pregnancy and viviparity. Um, however, uh, the question is, how does evolutionary biology is able to contribute to this uh, body of knowledge. And uh, one way to think about it is that uh, there's also a view that complex uh, situations, complex systems can also be understood by studying of how to make them. Uh, for instance, you can learn how, to, how an uh, 
radio works by just building one yourself. And uh, organic chemists have learned how, um, how molecules are structured by actually synthesizing these um, these uh, molecules and then they are sure that they really understand this. Uh, Recording in progress. This uh, uh, is, is, <coughs> is possible to put them together. Of course, we cannot synthesize an, an, an organism that you know, uh, has pregnancy, but we can study how, um, how it was to be uh, put together in uh, evolution, and that has the same uh, effect or the same uh, uh, benefit as uh, the, uh, the attempts to actually putting something together yourself. So if we study the evolution of pregnancy, we can ask uh, what steps in evolution were necessary to lead to what we uh, see manifest in a, in a woman. Uh, we can ask in evolution what obstacles were necessary to overcome to reach this particular form of reproduction and uh, which and even more important uh, which evolutionary innovations were necessary to overcome these uh, obstacles so this is the approach of evolutionary uh, developmental uh, evolution asking how this uh, process was uh, put together Okay, so let's start just with a few basics. Um, uh, viviparity, of course, is releasing a life young uh, instead of an egg from a maternal body. It's the alternative to egg laying. Uh, it's either an animal can either be viviparous or um, oviparous. And um, egg laying is the condition from which vivipary evolved. And actually, if I would be fundamentalist, I should have started with a whole lecture on uh, oviposition, but I didn't want to um, test your uh, patients too much with too much zoology. But we still have to realize that viviparity has to be seen as a modified egg laying process. And it sh we shouldn't be surprised that mechanisms and organs involved in oviposition in reptiles and birds, for instance, uh, can also be involved in viviparity and probably uh, actually are fundamental for how um, you know, uh, viviparity uh, was put together. And on the other uh, hand, we also, within viviparity, we have to recognize that there are many different forms of viviparity. So uh, luckily enough for a comparative <coughs> Biologist uh, viviparity actually evolved many times. Viviparity is known <clears throat> from uh, lizards, like in this uh, lizard here, so Toko vivipara, uh, that the name already indicates that they can give uh, uh, birth to live offspring. Uh, actually, very many sharks uh, are life bearing. And even insects, like this aphid insect, is giving birth to a young aphid here. And even most bizarre, even uh, uh, jellyfish can be vivi viviparous. Uh, the most <clears throat> simple metazoan organisms, also some of them evolved the uh, ability to give um, uh, to, to be viviparous. Of course, in fishes it is uh, found uh, quite frequently, and of course in mammals, as we all know. Now, <clears throat> the forms of viviparity. Um, or the viviparity as a term covers a large array of biologically distinct forms of reproduction. So there are simple forms uh, we will talk about with minimal maternal interaction. There's uh, a viviparity with placentation but no recognition of pregnancy, placentation and recognition of pregnancy but no implantation. Uh, and then there's the most complex form with. Uh, yeah, placentation, recognition of pregnancy, and implantation, as we know it from many mammals, including humans. So what is now the perspective of developmental evolution? The perspective is that evolution, in particular, of complex physiological and morphological characters is not an inevitable steady march towards functional perfection driven by natural selection. It's actually a process that is uh, you know, quite uh, uh, precarious, it, uh, comes in starts and, uh, and stops. And uh, in fact, um, each more complex form of reproduction, or each more complex form of any uh, character, uh, be it a, a physiological or a morphological one, 
uh, became possible through a specific evolutionary innovations. Each innovation is a biological mechanism that overcomes a constraint that was present in the ancestral species that prevented that species to you know, acquire certain uh, characteristics and to understand the more complex forms of reproduction or any other characters requires an understanding of how innovations overcame these ancestral constraints. Now, this way of thinking about evolutionary origination is, uh, uh, in my opinion, the um, unique uh, perspective of what I call developmental evolution. So let's start with the easiest form of viviparity, and that is uh, uh, a process that is simply realized through uh, egg retention. Egg retention, you find when you take, for instance, this uh, uh, pygmy swells uh, shark that is pregnant, and if you cut open the belly and find the oviduct, you find in the body of the, of the mother uh, eggs with the eggshell uh, and uh, embryos of uh, fetuses developing with the yolk. So most of the uh, you know, uh, supplies are coming from yolk as usual. Uh, and uh, of all what the mother is doing is retaining the egg for longer in the, in the body. So here in these diagrams, you can actually quite easily see the transition. So the oviparous uh, condition would be where the egg uh, spends very short amount of time, this, uh, this yellow uh, segment here inside the body, then it comes to oviposition, to egg laying, and then development, most of the developmental uh, phases in the environment. And of course, the relative time uh, it is between uh, uh, the egg is in the uh, feed in the mother or outside can vary dramatically. That is the process of egg retention. And um, egg retention is the first steps to uh, uh, viviparity, where longer and longer periods of time were spent by the egg inside the mother and short and shorter times uh, outside. And as soon as uh, the um, post over, over position period comes very short, we have technically spoken uh, viviparity, or I like to call it over viviparity, although some colleagues are actually, the majority of my colleagues don't like the term, uh, but be this as it may, um, as soon as the hatching then actually uh, happens inside the oviduct, uh, through viviparity is achieved. And then it's a question of how much time after hatching uh, the young animal uh, still uh, stays inside the mother and when it's uh, then born instead of uh, you know, hatching outside in the environment. Now, this is uh, uh, viviparity. If you compare it now across uh, uh, amniotes, reptiles, birds, and mammals, uh, there's one origination in the in mammals, uh, but there are many, many uh, uh, events, uh, evolutionary achievements of uh, viviparity in lizards, so-called squamates. And it turns out that the uh, vast majority of them is actually simply viviparity through egg retention. From that, we can um, uh, you know, deduce that egg retention is easy to evolve as it is in, in these sharks that I talked about a little bit for, uh, before. An example uh, is this uh, Zootoka vivipara, called also the common lizard, that has um, uh, different populations. Uh, here you see the uh, distribution of these uh, animals in Europe. Uh, the uh, blue area is, uh, is occupied by a subspecies called vivipara vivipara. This is the population that is actually giving birth to young. Uh, to young. But there are two other populations up in northern Italy and uh, Slovenia and Croatia uh, that uh, is uh, egg laying, as well as in the northern uh, uh, Spain and in the, uh, in the Pyrenees, there's another population of egg laying um, egg laying uh, oviparous uh, populations. And that is a very interesting uh, situation because these populations are very closely related to each other and it's possible to study uh, this transition between ovipary and uh, vivipary of this particular form uh, experimentally. And there was a recent paper uh, last year in Nature, Ecology and Evolution 
where they did a uh, you know, study of uh, genetic effects by crossing um, individuals from the viviparous and the oviparous uh, population, did a genetic mapping study and found a large number of concentration of genes in chromosome 8 that uh, are influencing the station time. There are also many gene expression differences uh, in the uh, oviducts or in the uterine of this uh, uh, oviparous and uh, and uh, viviparous uh, populations. Uh, egg retention is also easy to get lost. It's not a, a, a situation that once you have it, you have to stay with it. Uh, depending on the various ways of how the phylogeny is reconstructed and analyzed, the estimates of how often the, um, the uh, reversals are happened are you know, between 13 and 18 times. Here you see the tree of uh, living um, uh, lizards and snakes, and here the branches are colored by mode of reproduction, red are the life-bearing and uh, blue the uh, egg-laying uh, forms, and you can see that it's widely distributed uh, across different lineages of, um, of, uh, of lizards. Now, uh, an example uh, for this reversion is uh, a paper that Vincent Lynch has done when I was a student in my lab. And he realized that uh, uh, in a group of uh, sand boas that are mostly viviparous, there is one uh, species that is oviparous. And this species in the phylogenetic tree is deeply nested within the uh, tree of, uh, of uh, viviparous uh, forms. Now, of course, the question is always, shall we believe phylogenetic reconstructions? Is there any co uh, uh, corroborative uh, evidence that this inference is actually correct. Uh, in this case, there is, because uh, snakes, oviparous uh, snakes, have a structure here, the so-called egg tooth, that helps the young um, snake hatch out of the, out of the shell. Now, in, the, in this particular species, that according to the phylogenetic reconstruction, uh, is a secondarily uh, oviparous uh, form, this egg tooth is actually absent. So here is a life-bearing form uh, a species, and here is this egg-laying form. You cannot see the egg tooth here because it's absent. But so that's uh, uh, independent evidence that this uh, inference is uh, probably correct and that you know, this uh, uh, oviparous uh, ancestors have lost, have reverted to, uh, uh, the viviparous ancestors have then reverted to um, ovipary. So, so that leads us to this scenario that was proposed by uh, Daniel Blackburn uh, on the scenario for uh, squamate uh, evolution of uh, viviparity. Uh, so the first way station, if you want, from ovipary is this uh, form of viviparity that depends on um, egg retention, somewhat uh, maintenance of the corpus luteum, uh, some reduction in the membrane, in the shell membrane thickness, but it's still there, so the fetus and the mother are still physically separated from each other. Now, this form of viviparity evolved about 100 times, as I told you, um, uh, but the next step, namely uh, going to complex uh, um, presentation, also happened in lizards, um, but it only happens four to five times, depending on some uh, uh, things that you on, on the exact <coughs> inferences about uh, phylogeny. So here is an example. Uh, Mabuya is one of this, uh, is a skink that is viviparous and actually has a quite complex uh, fetal maternal interface with an interdigitation between uh, fetal membranes and the endometrium of the, of the, of the uterus. Here you see the um, uh, histological uh, uh, sections. And even in some places, there are very limited forms of uh, trophoblast invasion into the, uh, into the uh, tissue of the mother. Um, the most uh, advanced form of placentation in lizards uh, is this uh, Trachylepis. Um, it's the only known lizard to have an invasive placentation, so only one species, only evolved once, where the invasiveness is, uh, consists in the trophoblast uh, displacing uh, the uterine epithelium and leading to what you could uh, call an endothelial uh, placentation. <clears throat> so 
the neutron epithelium is displaced. But interestingly, the, uh, the trophoblast actually stops at the basal membrane of the eroded, um, of the eroded uterine uh, luminal epithelium. So, so this, what we can uh, learn from that is that egg retention form of, uh, of uh, uh, viviparity is easy to evolve about 100 times, much harder is uh, develop a complex placentation with direct contact between the fetal tissues and the maternal tissues. In uh, lizards and uh, so squamates, it leads to minimal invasion at most one-time erosion of the luminal epithelium, but there's no for, uh, case of uh, true implantation uh, uh, known or no hemochorial placentation as we know it from humans and rodents and other uh, mammalian. Uh, and actually, you know, the wall of the uterus of uh, all the uh, uh, life-bearing uh, uh, lizards that I know is actually so thin that it's even not thinkable that uh, an embryo could uh, in, uh, implant into this tissue. So what does uh, lizard viviparity tell us? Uh, just as a background, there are about 11,000 species. There's about 2,200 viviparous species. Um, where, and based on the phylogenetic relationships, we can uh, infer that a uh, hundred times uh, it evolved and about lost in 12 to 18 times. So egg retention is easy to evolve. It's easy um, and it leads only to limited changes uh, in the mother and the uterus, some uh, uh, gene expression differences. The, on the other hand, placentation is hard. Uh, it actually evolves much less than uh, four to five times in uh, lizards, leading to complex fetal maternal interface and some very limited uh, invasion. And even harder is uh, invasive placentation, even though even it's, it's uh, limited because we only know one case in uh, 11,000 species where, uh, where this has been achieved. And much harder it must be to actually evolve hemochorial placentation. There's no known case in lizard where this has actually happened. But this is, of course, what humans do and uh, uh, many mammals uh, uh, do. And so it's actually interesting to understand what obstacles are uh, in the way of, uh, of evolving this very deep form of uh, or very intimate relationship between the fetus and the mother. Um, and uh, how it has been achieved uh, to, um, to, to get to this uh, uh, situation. So to summarize this, I can actually cite uh, Daniel Blackburn, who in, in a review uh, some years ago, uh, actually made the point that lizard uh, uh, pregnancy is not a model for mammalian pregnancy, but the value of the squamate model ultimately lies in the insights it provides into the physiological problems rather than the university, universality of specific mechanisms that have evolved to meet those problems. So uh, from the evolutionary history, we can see which uh, forms of viviparity, which modifications of it are easily achievable and others which are hard. And then our task is to understand why it is hard and how it was overcome, for instance, in the human uh, lineage. With that, I would like to move on to uh, mammals. Um, just as a reminder, uh, there are three groups of uh, mammals, the monotremes, Platypus and Staphylococcus, for instance, the marsupials, with, you know, kangaroos or opossums and so on, and the eutherian, or also called or placental uh, mammals. So let's start with uh, monotremes. They are uh, only a few species, uh, but are famous for the fact that those are uh, bona fide uh, uh, mammals that still uh, lay eggs, and actually they have a situation that's quite similar to what we discussed before, namely they have a quite a high degree of egg retention, where um, about um, three uh, or two thirds of the development is um, of the of the young happens in in the body of the mother, and then after oviposition after egg laying. Uh, it continues to develop for another 10 days of external incubation. There is already some degree of mother trophy, so the 
uh, uterus of the mother provides um, uh, molecules diffusing through the eggshell to the to the uh, to the developing uh, embryo or fetus, whatever you want to call it. Um, so, uh, matrotrophy doesn't start with the placenta; it actually already happens in uh, species with uh, delayed uh, egg laying. So, there's time for the uterus to secrete stuff that can reach the the, the young. Now. Let's move on to marsupials. Uh, they are uh, actually more interesting even. Um, they are actually also quite heterogeneous in their um, uh, reproduction. Uh, there are many of them are polyovular with short gestation, no recognition of pregnancy as I will show you. And there are other forms that have uh, the, uh, macropodids, uh, wallabies and kangaroos um, that have uh, evolved independently um, some steps in the direction of what we know from Eutherian mammals, namely extended gestation and recognition of uh, pregnancy. So luckily enough, the most uh, primitive exemplar of, uh, of reproductive biology is actually one that we can study in the US as well. And that is the uh, Monodelphus domestica, the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the South American uh, opossum. Uh, if you look into the um, you know, gestation, it is actually sort of 14 days long, roughly, from uh, copulation that also coincides with uh, ovulation. Um, then it leads to fertilization and uh, placentation is present, but it is, um, it is epithelial corals, so the placenta lies on top of the uterine epithelium, and then birth is given at 14 days, and uh, they actually give birth to quite immature um, uh, neonates. Uh, they have a forelimb and a well-developed head, but not even a hindling, a hindling butt. So the posterior part of the, <coughs> of the neonate is quite underdeveloped compared to the anterior part. And here, monodelphins is actually a marsupial with all the marsupium. Um, there is no pouch there. Um, and, uh, uh, and the young are, are nursing from at the nipple of the mother uh, while sort of hanging off uh, her belly. Now, of the uh, 14 days of gestation, most of the time uh, the uh, fetus uh, and the mother are physically uh, separated from each other by a shell coat. Um, this is 11.5 uh, days, and only by day 12, the shell coat starts to disintegrate and then eventually by the end of the 12, the direct physical contact between the uh, placenta or the fetal membranes and, uh, and the uterus uh, occurs. So if we look at an opossum pregnancy, 12 days is essentially egg retention, then hatching within the, uh, the uterus and then there are two days only where there's a, an actual physical uh, interaction between uh, the, the fetus and the mother, and after two days of that process, uh, birth is uh, happening. And that is quite uh, different from what we are used uh, to from Ethereum mammals, for instance, the mouse, I uh, think all of you know, that implantation is four days after copulation, um, and most of the time of the gestation, of the 21 days of gestation, is in uh, where the placenta is in direct contact with the mother, so the mouse, 80% of the gestational time is actually in contact, while in the opossum, it's uh, only 14% of the gestational time in direct fetal maternal contact. And in humans, of course, it's 97% you know, of the pregnancy time is in direct contact with the mother. There are <clears throat> endometrial uh, changes, uh, changes in the endometrium that are uh, typical for the for pregnancy, even before attachment, the uterine glands are much more active uh, than they are in an estrous cycle. Um, and uh, also in after attachment, uh, uh, the glands are much more active at large lumen uh, compared to the estrous cycle. And the sub-epithelium uh, epithelial uh, uh, mesenchyme uh, disappears in during pregnancy in the, some Changing. So there's certainly the uterus is adapting to the presence of the fetus. Also, a, a, a 
also in terms of the uh, gene expression, the quite uh, uh, traumatic uh, reprogramming uh, uh, events happening. And if we compare uh, late uh, through the pregnancy or late, late uh, non-pregnant cycle and uh, late gestation, uh, you know, you would you find all of this di differential gene expression that you would expect functionally, you know, like, like fat metabolism, regulation of fluid levels, uh, and ion transport, and so on, that are important for uh, the support of the fetus. And, you know, you can also look into gene expression. Some of them are limited to the uterine glands and others to the epithelium. So that's... But <clears throat> the interesting thing is that if you look uh, endocrinologically at uh, uh, the uh, opossum pregnancy, and that was discovered already in 1981, um, the ovarian cycle, the non-pregnant cycle from ovulation to, you know, the, to the next ovulation and pregnancy are actually indistinguishable. So progesterone in particular uh, has this uh, uh, profile here. This is the time of uh, parturition. And uh, one of these two curves, this curve here is the non-pregnant uh, uh, cycle and the other one is uh, the pregnant one. The duration of uh, uh, progesterone production and high levels in the, in, the, in, the, in the blood of the mother are actually not distinguishable. And that is, of course, drastically different from what we know from humans where you know, a human embryo has to signal to the mother to maintain the corpus luteum through human chorionic amyotropin, and uh, progesterone levels are increasing and only start decreasing after birth, while in the menstrual cycle there is also progesterone going up, uh, but also uh, 14 days after ovulation it goes already down. So in, the, in, in humans, it is necessary to get an additional signal to maintain um, to maintain pregnancy and to uh, keep progesterone coming, in particular early. And then it is of course taken over by progesterone coming from the from the placenta. <clears throat> and this is actually a feature in among marsupials that most marsupials actually have no uh, difference in their hormonal cycle between the the uh, pregnant cycle as well as the uh, non-pregnant uh, ovarian cycle, here in this case the common brush tail possum. Possum and opossum are quite different animals. Uh, as uh, my uh, provost uh, for science once said, uh, an opossum is an Irish possum because of the O apostrophe uh, there. Um, <clears throat> or in this covari, uh, uh, it's all the same thing. Only in the um, relatives of, um, of, of kangaroos uh, is recognition of pregnancy evolved. So if you look at the phylogeny of marsupials, only down here um, in the macropodes, we have uh, clear signs of recognition of pregnancy. There's some degree of recognition of pregnancy in, in this group here, but uh, from these three other groups, actually quite closely related to the macropodes, there is no uh, recognition of pregnancy at all at the systemic level. There is, of course, one at the uterine and the mitral level, but at the systemic level, these animals are not, uh, uh, the bodies don't know that they are pregnant. Um, so wallabies, as I said, have a recognition of pregnancy, but uh, um, the, it's interesting uh, that in spite of having an elongated or extended gestation, what is not evolving is a, an intimate uh, uh, attachment of the fetal membranes to the mother. Um, here you see an uh, embryo hatching out of the, uh, of the eggshell. This is a little later stages. And uh, friends who work with uh, wallabies uh, actually tell me if you uh, have the uterus of a pregnant um, uh, wallaby, and you open up the, uh, the uterus, the fetus with the uh, fetal membrane just pops out. There's not even an attachment, um, uh, not to speak of an in implantation in these animals. So when we <coughs> compare uh, animals, um, uh, we have to distinguish uh, sort of two forms of viviparity. Uh, the one is where the whole gestation actually fits within the time window of the 
um, of, of the ovarian cycle. So where there are no uh, endocrine reprogramming is necessary during pregnancy, that we call the intracyclical um, uh, gestation that we find in opossum and which is probably ancestral also for all Therian animals and probably even for eutherians uh, before the evolved uh, extended uh, gestation. And the other form is this transcyclic uh, gestation, which is longer than the ovarian cycle. And this is, of course, uh, what we find in wallabies and other micropods and, of course, in eutherian mammals. So this form of, repro uh, of reproduction does not need maternal recognition of pregnancy because the hormonal uh, uh, environment is already provided by uh, the hormonal changes that happen during the, uh, during the uh, ovarian cycle, while um, in uh, this case, uh, maternal recognition of pregnancy is absolutely necessary. So maternal recognition of pregnancy is only necessary if the gestation is longer than the, uh, than the normal ovarian cycle. Now let's, uh, towards the end of uh, today's lecture, um, uh, briefly talk about the uh, uh, eutherian mammals a little bit. And uh, uh, of course, the main uh, difference uh, here is that in some, um, and actually, as I will show you, ancestrally, the uh, embryo is always uh, embedding itself in the tissue of the mother. And, uh, um, and uh, just a, a little bit reminder of the, um, of the terminology that we use to uh, describe the fetal maternal relationship in, in, in Ethereans. Um, there are sort of three large types um, based on cross uh, classification, simply uh, classified by the number of tissue layers or cell layers that separates the fetal blood from the maternal blood. Uh, Trophoectoderm on top of the uterine epithelium is called uh, epitheliochorial. If the epithelium is uh, eroded, but the two blood uh, vessels are still intact, that is called endotheliochorial. And of course, hemochorial is when the maternal blood vessels are locally destroyed and the uh, embryo uh, is a direct contact with maternal blood or the placenta. Now, if you put uh, these different forms of uh, placentation onto the phylogenetic tree of, uh, of, of mammals, uh, surprisingly, and, uh, and to the, uh, and to, um, uh, contrary to uh, wisdom up to 2006 or so, when uh, Derek uh, Wildman from the uh, perinatology research plan, uh, uh, branch has actually has, uh, discovered, as the, uh, the first time discovered, that the ancestor of <coughs> uh, all placental mammals was most likely a hemochorial animal, either hemochorial or endotheliochorial, but certainly not epitheliochorial. So the uh, most invasive form of placentation is already um, the primitive state within placental mammals. It also implies that the less invasive forms of placentation actually evolved many times independently uh, after or from a more invasive form of placentation. Now, the question of why uh, this eutherian form of pregnancy is actually so rare, uh, and I must say, I only know uh, no. Uh, the mammals, uh, I'm not, I haven't read a, a real uh, indication or a real study that convincingly shows that in implantation and hemochorial placentation exists anywhere outside uh, eutherian mammals. And, uh, and helping to understand why this is so uh, a special form of reproduction uh, helps to remember uh, that there are sort of a number of obstacles uh, that exist in order to achieve this form of uh, fetal maternal relationship. But I actually have found in the literature sort of three forms of para paradoxa. Um, the cell biological paradox are proposed by Diet, uh, Dietmar uh, Denka in the 1980s. Our own lab has, um, in collaboration with, uh, uh, with the perinatology research plan, uh, uh, branch has uh, discovered that sort of there's an inflammation paradox, I will explain this more in the next lecture. 
and also the much uh, better known immunological uh, paradox proposed by uh, Sir Medawal. So what is the cell biological uh, paradox? The paradox uh, stems from the fact that embryo attachment requires two epithelia to stick to each other at the apical surface of their, um, of, of their polarity. So the apical surface of an epithelium usually is uh, non-sticky and is made non-sticky through the expression of mucin uh, mostly, so this large uh, membrane-bound uh, protein with uh, lots of uh, glycans uh, to it. And of course, uh, we all know that um, the, uh, the first steps uh, from uh, apposition and attachment require uh, the removal of the mucin uh, cover. But that also means that not just uh, we, we remove uh, the, uh, the mucin cover, it also is actually a process that in which the epithelial cells lose some of their uh, epithelial polarity between apical and uh, basal uh, side of it. And uh, um, this loss of, uh, of polarity is in cell biological innovation that was necessary for um, attachment at least uh, and later uh, implantation to become cell biologically possible. And that is not happening, for instance, in the case of, uh, of the uh, wallabies that I showed you where the, the fetus is in the, uh, uh, in the uterus for extended time, but has no uh, attachment to the luminal epithelium. The inflammation paradox uh, uh, consists in the following uh, uh, you know, inference that you know, uh, implantation is an injury to the maternal tissue. Um, it's an invasive process and leading to damage of the endometrium. Uh, the tissue damage invariably should lead to fibroblast activation, inflammation, and neutrophil recruitment. If you in any other part of the body, that would be the consequence of tissue damage and a form of, um, of, of, uh, of sterile inflammation would be the, uh, the, the consequence. Uh, and if you recruit neutrophils, you would expect them to also attack the blastocyst, leading to pregnancy loss and also collateral uh, tissue damage. Um, so therefore, you know, we came to the conclusion that uh, inflammation is a problem uh, actually independent of the immunological status of the embryo. So this problem of that the embryo tends to in, in, induce an, an inflammatory, or well, the conditions under which inflammatory uh, processes should happen um, is actually an, 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 was an uh, obstacle for the evolution of, uh, of implantation. And this inflammation paradox is actually independent of the question of what the immunological status of the embryo is. It's different from the immunological paradox um, because it's uh, immediately uh, relevant uh, much faster than an uh, uh, adaptive immune re response could be mounted against the embryo. It had been, of course, recognized for a long time by uh, clinicians that inflammation is a necessary part of human pregnancy, both at the beginning uh, of pregnancy as well as at the end of pregnancy to in initiate, um, initiate uh, parturition. And it is only in the second trimester or in the middle phase of, of, uh, of pregnancy that you know, there is sort of a truce between the maternal tissues and the um, and the fetal tissues. Um, so let's briefly return to the opossum uh, pregnancy where we have this short period of, of, uh, of contact between the fetus and the, and the mother. And so what is happening there, we actually found a very clear signature of an acute inflammatory response. And, uh, and uh, we'll talk about this and the consequences for our understanding of implantation in the next lecture. And then there's, of course, the, uh, the immunological paradox that I think we all are quite familiar uh, with, is the idea that the embryo, in most cases, is actually allergenic or semi-allergenic to the mother. And you know, one would expect the adaptive immune system of the mother to uh, respond to this. And this is an idea that he, with which he has founded the uh, field of, um, of reproductive immunology. So uh, all of that to summarize what I said uh, so far, uh, 
um, viviparity is a result of a complex sequence of uh, evolutionary innovations. There's egg retention at the beginning, which is relatively easy. Matrotrophy is coming relatively soon, and this also seems to be rather un, uh, uh, unproblematic. Then there is a progressive loss of uh, the eggshell or the shell coat and leading to direct fetal maternal contact. Then another, when the gestation gets longer than the uh, ovarian cycle, there is the need to evolve various ways for the recognition of pregnancy. Um, and uh, finally, when it comes to uh, placentation or implantation, there are multiple cell biological problems that need to be managed uh, in the evolutionary transition to uh, extended gestation with uh, deep uh, implantation. I mentioned the cell biological, the inflammation paradox, and the immunological paradox. With uh, this, I want to just uh, point out that the next lecture in uh, in July, I will focus on the inflammation paradox and the immunological paradox and their relationship to each other. And with that, I uh, thank you for your attention.